Hello, <clears throat> good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to The Current, the North Central Region Water Networks Speed Networking Webinar Series. In this series, we introduce you to top-notch scientists, educators, and managers in our region, and what they've been working on lately that helps us all manage our soil and water resources more effectively. I am Rebecca Power, and I'm joining you from the University of Wisconsin. I will be your moderator. Since some of you may be new to the North Central Region Water Network, we are an extension-led collaboration among land-grant universities and our partners in 12 upper Midwestern states. And today, we will be talking about uh, linkages between soil health-promoting practices, nutrient management, and erosion control. Uh, we know these linkages are there. Uh, however, we're still learning what they are in different landscapes, agricultural systems, and under different climatic and weather conditions. In today's episode of The Current, we'll hear some of the latest research from across the region on, on these connections um, and, and what we, we know currently about those relationships. Before we introduce our speakers, a few notes to the participants about the way these sessions work. You can, uh, as you can see on your screen, you can submit your questions for the presenters via the chat box. Uh, this chat box is accessible uh, through the purple collaborate panel in the lower right hand corner of your webinar screen. There will be a dedicated uh, question and answer session following uh, the last presentation. So I'll you know, collect your questions from the chat box and, and ask them to the appropriate presenters. Uh, if you need a phone option, uh, if you're having trouble with the audio, you can access that phone-in option by opening up the session menu in the upper left area of your screen and selecting use your phone for audio. This session, uh, we do record these sessions and they are available at our website, northcentralwater.org, and also through eExtension at learn.extension.org. So uh, now on to our, our presenters for today. Uh, first, uh, it's not on your screen here, but first Francisco Arriaga, who is an assistant professor and extension state specialist at the University of Wisconsin-Madison is gonna introduce you to our North Central Region Water Network uh, Soil Health Nexus team and uh, Soil Health and Water Initiative. So Francisco is gonna uh, uh, introduce them and then uh, we'll hear from Nathan, Nathan Nelson, who is a professor at the Department of Agronomy at Case State, Stephen Safferman, who is an associate professor in the Department of Biosystems and Ag Engineering at Michigan State University, and then finally, Francisco's gonna uh, wrap us up. So um, thanks so much uh, in advance to all our presenters, and thanks to you all for joining us, and now I will turn it over to Francisco. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, just a few words um, about the Soil Health Nexus. Um, part of the reason why Rebecca wanted me to mention the Soil Health Nexus is because uh, one of the components within the Soil Health Nexus is actually trying to look at this linkage between soil health and water quality. Um, so I wanted to kind of uh, hopefully make everybody aware in the region and, and around the U.S. about the Soil Health Nexus. So it's a team that be, was initiated, uh, I think the first talks were in 2015, but more officially in 2016 uh, from different uh, uh, um, extension and, and university groups uh, in, within the North Southern region. Two of the uh, key um, leads for this were uh, Paul Gross and Christina Curiel, both of them with Michigan State. Uh, university, and uh, and then later on, uh, Leslie Johnson with the University of Nebraska Lincoln has been instrumental in kind of helping and lead the group. But um, we have a broader group than than that, as you will see in a second. So the main goal, uh, there's a lot of words in there you could read, but the main goal of of the Soil Health Nexus can be kind of summed up on that little uh, uh, those few words statements in the bottom uh, on the blue side of the slide there, as you can see on your left which is increasing access to soil health research extension resources. So basically the whole idea is to um, maintain and grow an inventory of soil health uh, research, uh, training, and educational resources. Could you go to the next slide, please? Or do I have control? There we go. Uh, so one of the things that, that we're very proud of, have been, we, we've been working as a team together for, for a while now, is a soil health toolbox. Uh, this is a screen grab from, from the website, our website. Uh, so 
hopefully different resources in here um, dealing with different parts of soul health. Another thing that I think was int instrumental to get more uh, traction with this group was the, the uh, combination of the soul health nexus with uh, a different group called the MASH group, which they were really interested in looking at similar issues with soul health, but they were more focused on, on manure management. Uh, but we started talking and kind of realizing we have a lot of uh, overlapping interests, so we, we combine. And so this, I think, make this group a, a lot uh, stronger. You can see there on the bottom all the institutions that are involved in the Soul Health Nexus. If you have any interest, please feel free to uh, uh, contact contact us. Or if you want to uh, subscribe to our uh, mailing list, as you can see there, we have uh, ways to do that through the website. Uh, so again, you know, the main purpose of, of uh, Soul Health Nexus, you can see the website uh, a little bit clearer there, is to provide uh, resources for research, but also training. That's a, one of the big parts that we do uh, for, for the region. And with that, I guess that's uh, all I wanted to say. Shameless plug for Soul Health Nexus. Excellent. Thanks, Francisco. Yeah, and if you uh, go to their website, you'll see um, a diversity of resources there. We were trying to compile resources across the upper Midwest uh, that while some soil health research and tools are state specific or even sub state specific, a lot of those resources can be used in common. So we wanted to just uh, make sure uh, people had as much access to some of those, those great resources as possible. And uh, so now to our regularly scheduled program, uh, uh, Dr. Nathan Nelson. Uh, Dr. Nelson is an outdoor uh, outdoorsman at heart. You can see um, he's not only interested in, I'm not gonna read this whole thing, but he's not only interested in, in the science of uh, cover crops and, and soils and watershed management, but also uh, the benefits that um, we all get when there's clean, uh, clean water that provides a, a diversity of, of uh, services um, when we're, we're managing soil and water well. So thanks. Nathan, for joining us, and uh, on to your presentation. Okay, thank you for the introduction. I uh, just want to make sure everybody can hear me. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Perfect. Okay, great. Okay, so I'll give a little bit of an overview over, uh, uh, about this project that we've been running, looking at, uh, in general, the impacts of cover crops and fertilizer management on sediment and phosphorus loss from some small watersheds. Um, as a, I'm not going to go into the to the reasons uh, why in great detail, but uh, phosphorus loss. Uh, I guess the short story is phosphorus loss is an important thing here in Kansas. We've got several reservoirs that uh, have toxic algal blooms and some water quality issues related to nutrients. Uh, phosphorus is part of that, and so uh, we have some local uh, some local reasons why uh, we're interested in trying to keep phosphorus out of uh, out of the water, as well as some reasons uh, on down the uh, the rivers uh, in in larger watersheds. So uh, our standard best management practice has always been to recommend producers subsurface apply uh, phosphorus fertilizer to minimize their losses. Uh, however, there are some advantages to surface application from an agronomic and timing and, and some expense things. So uh, we'd had several producers uh, that had asked us, they say, well, um, is there a way that we can su surface apply fertilizers or phosphorus fertilizers and still minimize phosphorus losses? And so about uh, four or five years ago, uh, we started looking into uh, cover crops. and uh, we wanted to really to know if cover crops uh, could be a best management practice to reduce phosphorus losses, uh, particularly from surface applied uh, fertilizers. Um, initially, we were thinking, well, uh, the cover crop should reduce runoff and could thereby reduce phosphorus losses from these fields. And so here's a list of the questions. We, uh, these are, we, we implemented a study in no-till uh, particularly, there, were, there weren't very many studies looking at the effects of cover crops on water quality, surface water quality, particularly in no-till agriculture. A lot of work looking at subsurface losses and, and uh, nitrogen losses. So um, we set up, uh, let me talk, tell you a little bit about the study. We took a field that was about 22 to 25 acres in size. Uh, this is a picture of it. It's, you can kind of see some parallel terraces. 
uh, that, that run across uh, the field. And those terraces were already in place. And so what we did is we put a waterway down the center and uh, put a berm around uh, another side and basically divided this up into 18 uh, small watersheds, each one draining to its own point as shown here in the figure with, uh, um, with the triangles. And so uh, with that, we could do some uh, replicated experiments. Each one of these is about um, 1.2 to 1.5 acres in size. The average size is about 1.2 acres or 1.3. Uh, here's a picture of the site uh, kind of looking up slope. Uh, it's three to 7% slope, so not, not a, incredibly sloping, but uh, got some, some decent, uh, some heavier textured soils and produces a fair amount of runoff uh, in, in large rainstorms that we have here. Uh, we implemented the study back in, actually started in, in 2014 is when we did a lot of the work. Uh, 2015 was our first cropping year. Uh, however, the site had been conventionally tilled uh, prior to this. And so when we moved into 2015, it was really, really resembled more of a conventionally tilled system. And so what I'll be showing is uh, data from the past three years, uh, because that first year wasn't really representative of, of a no-till system. Um, uh, the treatments that we have uh, for phosphorus are zero kilograms of phosphorus per hectare, 62 kilograms of P205 uh, fall broadcast, and 62 kilograms that are spring, uh, in, they're injected in, in a two by two placement at planting. And then, uh, so that, those are three treatments, and this is a factorial, so it's a two by three factorial. Uh, the other uh, treatment is cover crop, either with or without a cover crop, and the cover crop is alternated a little bit based on, uh, you know, harvest and weather and timing when we can get it in, but it's been kind of winter wheat and triticale, so a, a dominantly a small grain, but we've had some other, some rapeseed uh, with that as well. Uh, and this is a randomized experiment, and so along with, we're measuring a lot of uh, information soils and crop uptake and things like that. Today I'll just be focusing on some of the environmental measures, which is the runoff. Um, so we've got flow weighted composite samples of runoff from every single uh, runoff event, and I'll be focusing on the sediment, total phosphorus, and dissolved phosphorus concentrations uh, in those uh, in those um, uh, samples. And so. I'll run through real quick here, uh, you know, some of the results, and then and then uh, you guys will have something to ask questions about. So, uh, from a runoff standpoint, uh, we haven't seen an, any effect on annual uh, runoff. So the total amount of runoff uh, coming off the field every year uh, has been about the same with and without a cover crop. Uh, however, the cover crop has. In some events, we get more runoff from the cover crop. In some events, we get less runoff from the cover crop. It really depends upon the soil moisture. Uh, there are times when the cover crop actually keeps the soil wetter, uh, mainly in the spring after we've terminated the cover crop. Uh, we get rainfall events, and that, uh, that soil is more protected and, and tends to not evaporate or dry out as quickly. So other times of year, we get uh, less runoff. It, it really depends upon the growth stage of the cover crop. Uh, but what we do see pretty consistently, and is shown here in this figure, is that we get a change in the in the way the runoff comes off. The runoff comes off with lower peaks uh, with the cover crop, and then but comes off over a longer period of time, so a longer duration. Uh, so we get slower, uh, less intense runoff, uh, and that's pretty. That's much a much more consistent theme in the cover crop effects on runoff. Uh, so along with that less intense runoff, we get. Um, Less erosion, uh, quite a bit, 60 to 70 percent less erosion uh, with the cover crop, and that's a fairly consistent effect every single uh, event, as well as uh, when we sum events up across the year. So uh, that's a great benefit that the cover crops provide to water quality. Um, you would generally think that uh, that would decrease total phosphorus losses. However, uh, here this is event data, so this is the total phosphorus concentration for the with cover crop plots versus the no cover crop plots uh, for all the events over the last three years. And uh, you can see a few of them. I'll highlight now the, uh, let me highlight them here. 
Uh, there we go. The blue boxes indicate where the cover crop decreased phosphorus loss. The red boxes are where the cover crop increased phosphorus losses. And so uh, in the end, it kind of ends up being a little bit of a wash, particularly in 2016 and 2017, where there was no effect of the cover crop on total phosphorus concentration uh, in, the, in the runoff. In 2018, uh, it was a little bit of an odd year because um, we didn't get, we went for about eight months without any runoff at all. Um, but there we saw slightly higher concentration or higher concentrations of total phosphorus with, um, with the cover crop for, for most of the events in 2018. Um, what was more consistent though is the effect of cover crop on dissolved phosphorus concentration. And so here, again, as you look across the events, the double or the asterisks indicate um, where the, there was a significant difference between the bars in that event. And you can see most events, uh, we see higher dissolved phosphorus concentration uh, in the cover crop uh, treatment. And sometimes it tends to peak a little bit after um, we kill the cover crop. That looks that way in 2017. Um, other years, it, it's not quite that clean. Um, but uh, we see higher dissolved phosphorus concentrations uh, in, in general. Uh, where the cover crop is. So we're kind of trading dissolved phosphorus partic for particulate phosphorus. We, we decrease particulate phosphorus with the, with the uh, lower erosion and, and then increase some dissolved phosphorus losses. Um, so what this tells us is we really need some other uh, cover crops are great uh, for some aspects on water quality, but for phosphorus management, we need some other things, which is where we can turn to the uh, fertilizer management uh, side of things. Uh, and we see that subsurface placed uh, phosphor, uh, phosphorus really decreased our phosphorus concentrations, particularly uh, in the late fall and early spring events uh, each year. And uh, after we had uh, applied the subsurface fertilizer, uh, the phosphorus concentrations tended to be about equal after application of the fertilizer, but prior to that point, uh, tended to have higher concentrations where we had fall broadcast of fertilizer. Uh, and the same trend held true for dissolved reactive phosphorus, uh, slightly bigger uh, impact there. Uh, most of the impact of this fertilizer management is really decreasing dissolved phosphorus concentrations, no impact on erosion or particulate phosphorus. So if we kind of to summarize this, uh, if we sum these things up and look at the losses over the entire year, uh, this is total phosphorus losses. We see really uh, no difference in total phosphorus uh, between cover crop and no cover crop for 2016 and 2017, slightly higher losses in 2018. Um, but then uh, if we look at our fertilizer impacts, we see uh, spring injected uh, fertilizer management decreases our uh, total phosphorus losses, and um, that happened 2016, 2017. No effect in 2018, but 2018 was, again, uh, it was a drought year, and most of our losses occurred in just a few big events, um, so it wasn't, probably wasn't the normal, the normal year there. Uh, if we look at dissolved phosphorus losses, um, fertilizer management shows us about the same thing, um, but that's where we see the cover crop has higher dissolved phosphorus losses, every year, um, even though, so we're really kind of trading dissolved phosphorus for uh, particulate phosphorus in that treatment. Um, so that's the, the quick summary of, of what we have. Um, cover crop decreased our runoff intensity, uh, decreased sediment and particulate phosphorus. Um, however, it did increase dissolved phosphorus and had kind of a variable effect on total phosphorus uh, to this point. Uh, it tells us that we really need subsurface fertilizer management uh, or, or to use our fertilizer management to uh, decrease phosphorus losses and subsurface fertilizer management tended to decrease um, both dissolved and particulate phosphorus losses. So that's, um, uh, I see here are our funding sources. That kind of uh, is the summary that I have. Great. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, appreciate that. So, and so for those of you that are thinking about soil health, and I see a question there about measuring soil health, while Nathan didn't 
address those specific measures, you can, I'm imagining you're starting to come to some of your own conclusions because of the relationship between, at least we're keeping soil on the land with cover crops. We know there are a number of other soil related benefits for cover crops and we're, we're seeing some different relationships there uh, related to water quality, at least on the phosphorus side. So. Um, I, I will say in the discussion, if people have questions about soil health, we are taking soil health measurements. And so if there are questions for that in the discussion, I can address that. Perfect. Thanks so much. Okay, and on to our next speaker, Steve Safferman, uh, Associate Professor, uh, again, in, in Biosystems and Ag Engineering at Michigan State. Uh, and you can see a little bit more about Steve there uh, in his, his bio. Uh, and and Steve's going to talk a little bit about a situation where we're, uh, while we are helping soils uh, recover in some cases, you know, what what additional measures might we need to take to uh, address uh, phosphorus um, coming off uh, uh, farm fields, particularly and in, in entering the water. So thanks, Steve, so much. Okay, um, Janice is having problems, Steve, giving you some permissions to move your slides, so I'm going to go ahead and do that for you. Can we hear you, Steve? Oh, it seems like we are not. Uh, Steve, are you unmuted? Okay, well, let's, um, while we're working through those technical difficulties on Steve, I'm gonna go ahead or uh, maybe uh, Janice, if I'm gonna ask you first, if you could go ahead and uh, advance the slides all the way to, um, to Francisco's presentation. You're gonna whiz through uh, Steve's yep. slides quickly. On, just a minute here. I got it. I got it. All right, Francisco. Oh, and, I, Hi. and I think I heard Steve. <laughs> oh, <laughs> just did heard it. Hold on, Steve. Can, wanna... Steve, are you there? I am. Um, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. we can hear you now. Okay. okay. I apologize. Um, I'm not sure what went wrong, but. <laughs> That's okay. Okay, we'll we'll back ourselves up again uh, to the beginning of your slides. Thanks for bearing with us, everybody. On the you're you're getting a the backwards and forwards version of Steve's presentation. All right, <laughs> go go ahead, Steve. Thanks okay. so much. Yeah, thank you. Sorry about those technical difficulties, and I do appreciate the opportunity to be part of the current webinar. I want to um, recognize some of our. Associates that have been part of the project. Um, Jessica is my graduate student that's working on this assignment as an undergraduate student. Um, the work that I'm going to be presenting has mainly been supported by the Farm Marketing Program of Michigan, and we received uh, samples of materials from that material in ESSRE. So um, Nathan's um, provided the great um, background into, into a similar topic that we've been researching, and so I have some of my own dramatic pictures of um, algal issues in some of the Great Lakes region. And so basically cyanobophosphorus is thought to be causing some very high profile eutrophication and cyanobacteria events in, in the top uh, right pictures Lake Erie. And then the bottom two pictures are from Grand Lake St. Mary. And that's, um, the, the, the was at one time the largest man-made inland lake in the world. And so they've been um, having all kinds of problems with the algal growth, obviously, including recreational, loss of like recreational funding and so forth. And one of the big problems we have with uh, the cyanobophosphorus is it um, is 100% bioavailable, meaning that just a little bit can cause a big problem compared to particular phosphorus, which is only probably about 20% bioavailable. And so um, again, a little bit makes um, a big impact. And phosphorus itself is not renewable, it's valuable. There's only about six countries that um, we know that has um, a, a high supply of phosphate rock. 
Only a few of those countries are actually politically stable. And so it's a scarce resource. So as well as getting into our environment and causing environmental issues, it also um, is a valuable product that we're losing and we're wasting when it goes into the into our, our surface water. And keep in mind, there are no substitutes for phosphorus. It's not like gasoline in your automobile, where we might be able to replace that with a battery that's powered by solar energy or wind. We just need phosphorus for life. So um, we can set up a win-win circumstance if we can get it out of the, the, the water and recapture it and, and reuse it. So some background to how is acyl phosphorus getting into our surface water in the first place. And one of the uh, potential sources, one of the theories, is that it's passing through soil um, into tile drains and then to surface water. And um, obviously, the, um, there's, there's not tile drain throughout the whole country, but in the Great Lakes region, um, we have extensive tile drainage. And um, this tile drainage um, is thought to be one of the big impacts. So, so even if we try to, to use the best management practices we can to remove soluble phosphorus, and there's really not um, a lot out there that concentrates soluble phosphorus compared to the total or particulate phosphorus. Um, we're still probably going to get uh, some quantities of soluble phosphorus that does migrate off the cropland into the tile drain and then into surface water. And this is especially true if you consider modern agriculture where we have to have high yields to feed a growing world population. And so again, the, the, the problem is this soluble phosphorus is so potent, a little bit has a, a big effect. And so in this research, our hypothesis is that we can identify absorption media. Uh, this might be an engineered nanomaterial, a biochar, or waste material, such as an iron slag, that can efficiently remove the phosphorus and maybe even enable us to recapture that phosphorus for beneficial plant reuse. And so the objective was to test variable, various media and look at the, the economics of that, the efficiency of it, and determine uh, is, is there potential for the, such a model and which types of, uh, of media would be the, be the best. And so we'll start with the, the media that we selected. And first we looked at the biochar and biochar is produced by paralysis. And so we produced a biochar from corn stover. And in the picture on the right is a um, paralysis system. It's a pilot scale paralysis system. We actually used a, a, a bench scale at this point. We did have to pre-treat the, the, the corn stover going in to maximize its absorption for phosphorus. Um, and keep in mind that the paralysis process um, can be self-sustaining, in other words, once the system's running, it produces a syn gas that can be combusted to, combusted to power uh, the system to produce the biochar. And so that was one of the medias. The next types of medias that we used were engineered materials. So these are manufactured from various um, substrates. The PO4 sponge is manufactured by Metamaterial. The ferric um, nano is manufactured by ESSRE. And so this is kind of a new trend in the industry for all kinds of applications. And if you're not familiar with the George Barley Prize, I'd recommend that you um, look that up. Uh, this was a, a competition with a very large prize of $10 million focused on the Everglades, although there was some work um, from in, in Canada and some funding put up by the Canadian government. And about 400 or so companies um, were involved initially, and they went through different tests and trials and now it's down to four companies and the finalists that are actually demonstrating up with uh, full-scale systems at the Everglades. So both these um, organizations were within the top 10 of the, of, of the companies. So they made it down to um, within the top 10. They did not um, go any further. Metamaterial Meta actually dropped out of the competition. The ESSRE did not. But nevertheless, um, the, the theme of using engineered media uh, was pretty much prevalent for all of the competitors. Um, including the four finalists. And it's just a little bit more detail on the phosphate sponge because we've worked with this particular material for over a decade. And so phosphate sponge um, this, um, it, it has an iron-based substrate, and it's a, it's a foam that um, is kind of like a ceramic, although you don't have to fire it at high temperatures. And then you grow nanocrystals on that, and you have a, ultimately a surface area that's very high, about 100 square meters per gram. The gram is equivalent to about 10 one millimeter diameter particles, so small quantity. 
Um, it's even possible to have more surface area, but we found that it's not just actually not very useful to have any more surface area than 100 square meters per gram. And yet, uh, we do have a high porosity, about 80% porosity, so water goes through pretty easily. And we found that we can uh, absorb up to over 100 milligrams of phosphorus per gram of, of, of media, but this is equilibrium based, so it depends on the starting concentration within the, the effluent that we're treating, and that determines the ultimate capacity. And just again to show you some background information, this is um, results from a, a study we did for on-site wastewater treatment, so a much higher level of phosphorus than we see running off um, fields. So we're in about a seven, seven and a half milligrams per liter. And this was treating, this was a pilot system treating waste from about 43 homes. And um, you can see we consistently got down to uh, below 0.5 milligrams per liter over 60 days. And we estimate that was about a third of the capacity of the specific system that we were examining. Um, and we've actually run these columns for over 600 days straight. Um, so again, depending on how we design the column, that depends on the capacity. Um, and then what we did, um, we can re re um, recover the phosphorus out of this material and reuse the material. Um, but we also tried a hydroponic study, and that's what's shown on the bottom. And then this was with lettuce. And so the only phosphorus source for the the, the good-looking lettuce down there was this media, and as you can see, it actually produced um, equivalent quality um, commodity as compared to artificially providing the phosphorus with the different nutrients. So we think recovering this media, um, either direct use or um, extracting the phosphorus for hydroponics could have a lot of potential and have high value. And finally, we looked at some slag, some waste slag, and there's actually a company in the Dearborn, Michigan area that does actually process this waste slag into um, into different particle sizes, and this has been used uh, for various phosphorus absorption systems. And so we're comparing that material also. So we started with rural tile drain from this uh, Center of Excellent Farms in Michigan, and this is a series of farms that um, there's currently research being conducted um, looking at both the runoff and uh, the tile drain um, materials and what's going, what's um, within those areas. And we made several measurements of that characteristics, and especially in regard to what we knew could compete for absorption sites and um, reduce the, the amount of capacity that we have in some of these medias. And we have since been running on synthetic tile drain uh, as, as we don't have the flow that we need for the experiments at this point. Um, but we're not seeing any, any dramatic difference between the synthetic or the actual tile drain, so we're pretty content um, that the, the, the synthetic is um, performing as we expected. And with this, um, these different materials, we're doing isotherm studies to determine the capacity. And then we're doing simple column studies. And these column studies help us determine design values, such as the bed contact time um, for um, the different media. And then with that data, um, this is just a sample from, from one of the columns. And this is, again, the phosphate sponge. And you can see that we're starting at a tremendously low, uh, lower level in the tile drain, 0.3 to 0.4 milligrams per liter. And we're seeing uh, roughly a 50% reduction. And this is um, not particularly surprising, again, because this media is driven um, by, by equilibrium. And so the less concentration we have in the influent, um, the, the, the less um, we're going to get removed. Um, and then we're going to have to adjust uh, different design parameters, for example, increasing the contact time if we have desire to remove more of that phosphorus. And finally, with um, all of this um, data, um, we're going to um, conduct a preliminary design of what the system would look like in the field and do some estimations of the size, the capacity, and the economics for each. And that would enable us to provide some extension on whether um, any of these products um, have potential uh, to be, be used and what, what that potential is. And, uh, and of course, in that analysis, we're going to be looking at the the benefits recovering that phosphorus for beneficial use. And with that, um, I do have my contact information here on the bottom, and I believe there'll be some time for questions um, toward the end of the presentations. Yes, there will be. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate that. And uh, in the interest of time, just because we um, had that little glitch, we're going to go right on to Francisco.
Uh, so Francisco uh, Arriaga is an assistant professor uh, and extension specialist with the Department of Soil Science at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, now the Division of Extension. Um, and his current research program focuses on sustainable soil and water management for both enhanced crop productivity and environmental quality. So uh, thanks, Francisco, and uh, take it away. And thank you, Rebecca. And there's a new logo of the Division of Extension there on the bottom right. Mm -hmm. Hey, good afternoon. So uh, it's me again. So I took a little bit of different approach, I guess, for, for the presentation today. Um, so my area of work, it's, uh, it's I call it sustainable soil management. So it's soil and water conservation and management. Um, so I wanted to look more into uh, soil conservation practices. Can these lead to soil health uh, improvements? And then those do those uh, improving soil health do they translate to water quality improvements? So trying to make that that linkage. And um, there's uh, not a lot of information out there. Um, I mentioned the soil health nexus uh, earlier. Uh, that's one of the goals or one of the things that we're trying to do. It's uh, to to see what information is out there and and trying to compile that uh, and then look at gaps and then hopefully use that information to uh, uh, so produce in a form that, that researchers can use it and, and maybe see what those gaps are, which somewhat like some of the uh, interest too of the Soil Health Institute uh, as well. So some of you are familiar with that. So, with that, I'll have to put the plug in, I guess, for soil health. We know that it's all about function, right? We're trying to grow crops, but we know that a lot of the things that are happening in soil are uh, related to water. And this is kind of uh, what we're focusing on today. And so when I talk about conservation practices, or we talk about in general conservation practices, we're talking about things like tillage, right? Reduce tillage, no-till, those type of things, uh, even tillage rotation. Uh, but also things like crop rotations, uh, contour planting, strip cropping, cover crops, uh, the use of manure, right? That, that could be a, a good thing to improve soil. Um, other organic amendments, uh, use of buffer strip maybe could be. Uh, in this case, I'm gonna focus mainly on tillage and, uh, and cover crops for our discussion today. So the first uh, project I wanna talk to you about, it's uh, one that we started back in the fall of 2013, I believe. Um, and it's uh, related to a um, forage production system. So in Wisconsin, obviously, you know, uh, we have a lot of uh, dairy cows. So we have a lot of forage production. Corn silage is one of the main ones, so alfalfa. And you, often those are grown in rotation. So what we had in this project is uh, corn and alfalfa rotation. So three years of corn silage followed for, with three years of alfalfa. And we have both phases uh, of the of the rotation present. So we had in here two tillage systems, a no-till system and then a conventional. And the conventional is essentially a um, full chisel uh, operation uh, followed by a finisher in the spring. And then we had uh, three different cover crop uh, managements here, a no cover crop control, uh, cereal rye, uh, which it was chemically terminated a couple of weeks before planting the, the corn. And then we had another one, which I'm not gonna be talking much about uh, here for the purpose of the water quality, because we couldn't do measurements on that one due to resources and, 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 and uh, lack of resources and time. But we also grow the cereal rye as a as a forest. So we harvest that uh, last week of May as a rye lich. Um, and so it's managed slightly different. So we had also the same treatments on, on the conventional as far as cover crop. So one of the things we did, we had a master student uh, named uh, Laura Adams uh, that now works as a technician here for me, um, doing or looking at uh, this this part of the, the, the project. And so we ran a rainfall simulator. You can see the simulator here in the back of this tractor. Uh, what it is, is just essentially a tower that is about 10 feet tall and there's an oscillating nozzle on top that uh, we basically rain over a metal frame. You can see the metal frame down here on the bottom and the uh, the tent basically over it to keep wind from affecting the raindrops. And so we can apply certain intensity to rainfall. In this case, we did uh, about three inches an hour, three and a quarter uh, for an hour. And then we have this uh, setup here. You can see this little PVC tube with holes in it. And there's a hose that runs all the way from the tower all the way to this uh, Behind this other tractor, we have a vacuum system, so we can collect runoff, and then we can look at uh, runoff production, and then at the end of the simulation, we can collect a sample for sediment, phosphorus, and all those kind of things. 
Um, so one of the things I, I want to say is that the, the system itself, uh, I say when I uh, talk about it, I say that it's a still quote unquote, because we are applying 10,000 gallons uh, per acre of, of liquid dairy manure. That's something that a producer here would do uh, fairly uh, commonly on, on this type of uh, systems. Uh, so we need to inject it because the uh, uh, operation we're in, it's a CAFO, so we're required uh, to inject it. Uh, we conducted the simulations in June, October, and April to get kind of different snapshots in uh, time of the year. So if you saw the presentation of Nathan, he, he's got the, uh, I guess, luxury, I would say, that he has edge of field monitoring equipment so he can monitor throughout the year. Uh, the That's a good advantage. However, that setup, it's uh, very labor intensive, very expensive to run. Uh, so this is kind of another way of, of looking at runoff. You're just taking snapshots under control conditions, but then you're missing maybe um, uh, times of the year here, some, some time in Linus. So let's jump in and look at this data. So what we have here is accumulated runoff in millimeters. On the top is the April simulation, middle is the June, and then the October. On the right, you can kind of see uh, pictures of how that cover crop looked like uh, for the treatments that had that cover crop. So if we look in April, you know, that cover crop, we had a decent amount of growth out there. And uh, if you look at the cumulative uh, uh, runoff production, regardless of tillage, that cover crop was very effective in cutting um, runoff by about half, if not more. Uh, just for your reference, that dash red line is just indicating the total amount of water that we applied as, as, as rainfall. So come to June, you know, in June, the, the, the corn is at about V3 or so. Uh, you can see here, this is actually a no-till treatment. You can see some of the uh, residue of the cover crop on the surface. So if you think about the conventional tillage, we ran a finisher through there. So there's, uh, there would have been a lot less residue. And so when you look at the cumulative runoff here, uh, what you see is that the no-till with the cover crop, which is this purple line, did reduce then uh, runoff production. Uh, under this scenario, and all the other treatments basically landed on top of each other. Now we go to October and we see that there's no difference between any of the tillage or cover crop treatments. You can see on the picture here uh, that there's very little residue. So when we conducted the simulation was a few weeks after um, mineral injection, then the cover crop was established. And you can see then when we did the simulations, there was just a little bit of cover crop residue on the soil surface. Being that this system is corn silage, there is very little residue left over because most of that corn biomass uh, on the surface gets harvested for, for forage. So this is a system that could clearly benefit from some, uh, some residue by the use of cover crops. Uh, but depending on time of the year and how early you establish it, you know, your, your mileage might vary. So here we are looking at total phosphorus in bioavailable, bioavailable phosphorus. So on the top, it's uh, bioavailable phosphorus. So this is an average for the entire um, for the entire year. Um, that's the factor that came out as significant. You can see that the cereal rye as a cover crop was very effective. Looking at total phosphorus, there was an interaction between the time of the year, so the time that we did the simulation and the the, the use of the cover crop. Uh, basically, the biggest difference that you see ties into what we saw with the cumulative runoff. Uh, April, we had the biggest difference. Uh, no difference in October, really, between the two, and no statistical significant difference in June, but the overall losses are much, much lower in, in June. So what about soil health? So here we're looking at a couple of soil health, quote unquote, parameters. We have potential mineralizable carbon here on the top left, uh, the Solvita CO2, which is uh, analogous basically to the potential mineralizable carbon open rewetten. Uh, so that's the CO2 evolution after you re-wet the samples. Uh, potential mineralizable nitrogen, and then wet aggregate stability. And you can see, looking at the cover crop effect, that that cover crop, um, that cereal rye as a cover crop, was effective and helped increase the health of, of the soil. These samples were collected after the, after, the uh, after corn, after the first three-year cycle of the rotation. So this would be kind of uh, after three years of, of that management. And so we can see that that difference here also in potential minerals of absolute nitrogen. And then we see here, in this case, we also have the harvested cover crop, the rylage, uh, but we see greater uh, water stable aggregates uh, when you have a cover crop present. So if we kind of start putting the dots together, 
And kind of thinking about a cover crop, in this case was the, the overwhelming factor uh, compared to tillage, let's say, we could say that the cover crop improved soil, function, soil function, excuse me, by reducing total runoff. You can see here total runoff was reduced by the cover crop. It also reduced phosphorus losses. So then we're looking at a water quality impact. And uh, some of it, we could argue that it's related to the increase in aggregate stability. So there was uh, clearly an increase in aggregate stability, but also an increase in infiltration uh, by the presence of that cover crop. So we can kind of see that, and we're starting to put those dots together uh, when we're looking at soil health and water quality. But what about other times of the year? So here's data from a, from a different project. Uh, in this one, we were doing um, plots that were about 15 by 15 feet by 50 feet long. And we were here mainly interested in runoff during the frozen season. So when the soil is frozen in the winter, uh, a lot of uh, dairy operations here in the state, they're, they're small. And so they have to do uh, daily haul. They don't have uh, of manure. Uh, they don't have uh, storage capabilities and that is actually allowed uh, in the state currently. And so we were interested in looking at the timing of application and then the roughness of the soil surface as far as what would be the impact of on runoff. Uh, so in this case, we're looking at then a tillage, uh, fault chiseling in a no-till scenario. This field was actually prior to, to us uh, taking it over for this work was on a alfalfa stand for about four years. So that no-till should be fairly representative to a, a more uh, stable uh, tillage no-till system. Uh, and again, we're running uh, or growing corn silage. And then what we did for the winter liquid manure applications, uh, we applied, um, applied it in December. So the idea was before the ground completely froze uh, on top of no snow, and then late January with uh, frozen soil on top of snow. Uh, the liquid manure uh, came basically from uh, their production facility there at the research station uh, out of their their uh, their lagoon directly. All right, there's the arrow. Sorry about that. Oh, I guess I, I mentioned quickly here. So at the end of the plots that you see here down slope, this is about a 6% slope uh, on these plots. We had these uh, wing walls and then we had this uh, connection here uh, to a 3-inch PVC pipe that came to a box uh, lower down in the slope. Uh, where the water then for one plot would land in here in these buckets. And this is essentially just a crown splitter to uh, do split uh, collection of samples. So we're collecting, once this bucket fills up, we collect 1 24th of the volume into the next next one. And then same here. So we collect, we can collect about a five inch uh, runoff event. And this would be then the adjacent plot. So here uh, we're looking at two winter seasons, the 2015 to 2016. Um, and I guess I failed to mention this work was conducted by my former PhD student, Melanie Stock, uh, who is now a faculty member at Utah State. And what we see here, the solid lines, uh, it's uh, the no-till plots, and the colors are the different manure application timings, including a control, and then the dash lines are the chisel plow. And so one thing that might be uh, calling your attention is that with the no-till, we had a lot more runoff on uh, the first winter. You can see that most of the runoff was generated during one uh, melt event. In the winter of 2016, 2017, uh, we had uh, kind of a long melting event. There was like multiple uh, melt events that runoff events that ran into each other. But overall, if you were to look at this, there was a greater runoff uh, with the with the no tillage in this scenario. This is what the total phosphorus uh, losses uh, look like for the winter of 2015, 2016. So here's chisel, here's no-till, and you can see there's greater more. Um, and, and here's the 2016, 2017, uh, and here the, with the chisel. So what's happening here? How come we're seeing more runoff uh, with, with the no-till? So we're here on a 6% slope. Uh, these are molly soils, so they're very nice prairie soils, so they inherently have really, really good structure, even with that chisel uh, system. And so one of the things that uh, Melanie tried to do uh, during the, her, this work was to try to uh, look for differences in infiltration rates, which is very difficult to do during the winter. Uh, but essentially, we found that there was no difference in, in runoff and infiltration between the two. So what we are uh, speculating is that um, the tillage uh, provided basically a rough surface, so provided uh, areas where the uh, water could accumulate and have a longer contact time to the soil to infiltrate versus no-till, which it was a smooth. The other thing that happens too is that um, 
the soil being darker uh, when you apply the manure, that actually increases the generation of, of runoff. And sometimes you would see on the uh, till ones that you would see a little bit more darkness. So that's probably going more energy into the soil that it's helping melt, melt that too and, and let it infiltrate. Last but not least, I want to show you these. These are from a, a uh, field day that we did uh, on some long-term plots uh, comparing tillage, no-till, and full chiseling. And in the middle, you have a row till. Those are alleyways, so it's just to show soil being beaten up. Beaten up. So this is, again, a nice molly soil, but long-term tillage. You can see a clear difference here. And if you can imagine, this is water quality. You know, if you were thirsty, I think I would drink this, this water up here on the left, right? And clearly, these, we were able to link these uh, differences to organic matter and reduce uh, disturbance. So it was the management right, uh, that, that generated that. And we had greater infiltration too. But in the interest of time and leave some time for, for questions, I'll leave it at that. And uh, we'll jump into questions. Excellent. Thank you, Francisco, so much. And uh, we're going to go right up to um, uh, the first question, which is about how each speaker defines and measures soil health, which we could probably take the next hour on. But uh, if you could briefly uh, answer Andy's question, that would be great. So I will guess I'll take the first step of it. Uh, I try not to define uh, soil health per se. Uh, I, I, I try to look at different parameters. I, I think we don't have a good index, for example, that could lump things together yet and come up with like a certain value. So what I try to do, I focus mainly on aggregation and then the biological, some of the biological activities to assess uh, soil health. Uh, and that's the way I've been doing it. Uh, might not be the best way, but that's how I've been tackling it. Okay. So this is Nathan. Um, we, uh, I guess I don't really have a, a definition, but I'll tell you some of the things we're measuring. Uh, we're measuring uh, aggregate stability. And so higher aggregate stability would be better soil health. Uh, we're measuring biological uh, parameters such as enzyme activities, um, microbial biomass, and, and a few other methods of, of measuring microbial activity. And generally, higher biological activity, higher enzyme activities would generally be uh, higher soil health. Hi, this is Steve. And I guess I have a little bit different perspective based on my specialty and my research. But I, I also look at a healthy soil as one that can retain the nutrients and um, prevent the nutrients from running off or going through into tile drain so that they're available for uh, plant growth because that protects the environment, but also um, it's just more sustainable because those nutrients are you, being used for what, what they were intended to be used for. Great, thanks, you all. And I, I mean, I, we could do a whole webinar uh, on this topic. So thanks for those those brief answers, and maybe we will do a whole <laughs> webinar uh, on this topic in the future. Uh, Jeff uh, asks about uh, research, the, some of the research here indicating that cover crops can increase dissolved phosphorus concentration. However, cover crops can decrease runoff volume. So what does this mean for phosphorus loading? Is it a wash because of the higher concentration but less runoff? So that's really for uh, both Nathan and, and Francisco, I believe. We did not find that cover crops reduced overall um, runoff. And, you know, we can talk about some of the reasons why this, this can change perhaps with soils, but our soils, we did find um, the cover crops increased aggregate stability, which is generally associated with better infiltration, which would make you assume less runoff. Um, but we've got uh, a subsoil that, that it goes from a silty clay loam on the surface to a silty clay and, you know, pretty low um, hydraulic conductivity in that subsoil. And so we're expecting that, you know, it's going to take a long time before we really uh, affect the properties of that subsoil to the point where we, we have more per deep percolation. So, we, so there, you know, there are some complicating things there. And when you look at that over an entire year, uh, there are definitely periods of the year where we get more runoff and we have generally more residue uh, on the cover crop soil surface throughout, even throughout the year, even now, you know, or I guess even in the fall after we harvest, we still have more residue because some of the cover crop residue hangs around. 
and what that does is it gives us um, less evaporation and we, we end up with wetter soils, um, particularly when we get rainfall events one right after another, right? With, with fairly, you know, with only a few days in between, the, the non-cover crop soil dries out faster. So in my case, uh, we, we did see a decrease in runoff with, with the cover crop use. Uh, the soil we're working uh, in, uh, it's a, actually a fairly nice soil. It was actually on a, on a farmer's field that we're renting. Um, but we did see a decrease in, in runoff uh, in, in our scenario. <clears throat> I, I suspect that some of the increase due to the cover crop has to do when the cover crop senesces and dies that it can really, the, the tissue can, can release some nutrients. And Francisco, you didn't uh, look at differences in loading uh, as a result. Uh, oh. We only look at loading. We didn't look at just concentration. So we looked at the data that I showed was loading. Okay. Okay. Great. Yeah. Thank it you. was mass per acre or hectare, whatever. And I and I guess I can I can comment a little bit on the increased concentration. There have been several studies that have found increased concentrations uh, from cover crop, uh, increased concentrations of dissolved phosphorus in cover crop fields. A lot of this was done. A lot of the research was done in more northern climates than Kansas, and so. A lot of that was attributed to uh, freeze thaw in the winter and snow melt runoff in the in the spring uh, that had higher concentrations. Uh, we don't really have those same things, but we still saw higher concentrations. Um, some of that could be due to uh, release from the residue, but some could also be due to a higher contact time with the soil. So we have, uh, as, as I did say, we see much slower runoff from the cover crop plots, uh, which is, is a good thing for, for other reasons. It uh, slows down the, the runoff and slows down the erosive power and things. But with that higher contact time, that could be also contributing to uh, more dissolved phosphorus in the runoff. We're not exactly for sure why we see a higher dissolved phosphorus, but we have some ideas. Great, thanks to you both. Um, in addition to the dissolved phosphorus, uh, you know, the reason for the dissolved phosphorus, Katie is uh, saying she's unfamiliar with subsurface pea fertilizer BMPs. Can the speaker give an example of what this means? Sure. Um, it's just placing that phosphorus below the soil surface. Um, and this can be done with, with a variety of different uh, implements, either at tillage or planting, or could be a separate application altogether. We, we had, uh, the way we did it is uh, we had a planter and had a separate fertilizer application unit on it. And so as we were planting, uh, there was a fertilizer application unit that was, uh, had a disc and, and a coulter and a knife. And uh, it was injecting fertilizer at about two inches below the soil surface. So not a real deep placement. You have other options like a strip till unit. Now that, that's more heavier tillage, but a strip till unit can, put that four to six inches deep. Um, there are some other uh, application equipment uh, that can be used in no-till, but generally a little bit shallower there again, if it's low disturbance in a no-till system. Okay, great, thank you. And Francisco, I know you could probably add to that a little bit, but I'm gonna move on in the interest of time to Tony's question. And we're gonna probably just go a couple minutes over. So I'm gonna thank all of you for uh, for attending, but I'm gonna get to these last two questions here, um, or last three uh, regarding Steve's presentation. Uh, Steve, could you say something about the degradation potential um, with uh, with time for the post consumer products and specifically the furnace slag? Uh, yes, we haven't actually looked at the furnace slag in terms of beneficial use of the phosphorus. Um, after it's been in place and exhausted. Um, however, um, the emphasis has been on the engineered media and that can be regenerated with a simple chemical process. However, the hydroponics photograph that I showed that was with um, PO4 sponge that had not been pretreated, so that was the exhausted media directly out of the column that was absorbing the phosphorus. And the plant development was delayed, and although the plant looked uh, pretty pretty good after 
full development, but it was delayed by two to three weeks. So there was a slow release of that phosphorus. And since the mechanism of all these products are the same, it's quite simple, it's just surface complexation of the phosphorus. I, I, I'm guessing, but we don't, again, don't have the data. It's gonna be um, similar that if you use the slag directly as a fertilizer, there would be a delay in the, in the release of the phosphorus and uptake by the plant. Great, thank you, Steve. And uh, Eugene asks, what was the type of cover crop that did not impact phosphorus runoff? Um, uh, Francisco, I think that was during your presentation. I'm not sure exactly what Eugene was referring to, but maybe you you know. I, I think that was for Nathan. Uh, oh. I, it's oh. impact. I see. I see. I saw a positive impact. With, I so, was able to use the right. Sorry. Yeah. So we uh, we had. Uh, uh, winter wheat one year and then another year we had the other two years we had uh, triticale and rye or sorry triticale and rapeseed uh, so it was a, a mixture uh, I will say that we there's not a lot of information on the cover crop the effect of cover crop species on phosphorus loss um, we took what limited information was available and tried to select those cover crops that would uh, release the least amount of phosphorus to the runoff, so those that would that would potentially not increase dissolved phosphorus. Um, and then at the same time, we tried to choose those cover crops that would give us good cover, use plenty of water, so that uh, they were they were going to be growing during the cool times of the year uh, to try and maximize water use and and potentially minimize runoff. So that's the way we selected them. Um, to, to try and get the biggest benefit of those cover crops. But like I said, there's not a whole lot of information out there. Great, thank you, Nathan. And last but not least, from Sean, uh, Francisco, did you test for, or was there a linear relationship in aggression, in a regression of total phosphorus loss on aggregate stability in the simulation study? So that's, that's an awesome question. So that's the type of relationship that I'm hoping in the future come up with. Uh, we are still kind of looking at these data uh, I'm not sure if I feel too comfortable on doing linear regression or any type of regression because we don't have enough enough points. Uh, so we would, you know, if you if you remember the there was a timeliness, right? So we would have to look at the different times that we did the simulation to to look at those uh, separately, and then we have three replicates for each uh, each of the treatments or the management scheme. So so that uh, greatly reduces. But this is the kind of information that I'm after, kind of looking at those relationships. That's that's a great uh, great question. Sean, thank you. But yeah, stay tuned. We'll be coming in the future. I, hope. I wanted to get to that that question. So um, thank you so much uh, to our speakers, uh, Nathan, Steve, and Francisco. Uh, you know, looking at uh, some of these relationships between soil health and water quality, and also you know when the soil, uh, as Steve indicated, is not um, you know maintaining those nutrients on the landscape for whatever reason. What are some other things that we might be able to do? Uh, uh, appreciate all of you um, on the line who participated with us. We've got a, a lot of smart people out there too, and uh, thanks for participating in the conversation. Our up, our next session uh, is on April 10th, uh, 2 p.m. Central, same time, and uh, that presenter will be yours truly, uh, myself, uh, on getting to scale in successful watershed management. You can register at the same place, North Central Water northcentralwater.org uh, backslash the current. Uh, thank you all and have a great rest of your afternoon. Thank you all. Thank you.